Well, welcome back guys. Sorry for the delay. Had to uh, get a microphone rigged up because some of our gear has been scattered. My fault though, I'll take uh, full responsibility for that. So we have a few things to cover on this particular live. Uh, first, I wanna give some recognition to uh, my uh, Twitch community that are here in the YouTube. I've started doing something recently just for some of you all to be aware of. Uh, recently, I have been banned from streaming on Instagram. Uh, for whatever reason, they don't want me doing lives on there anymore, which sucks because I love streaming and answering questions. It's a lot faster and more efficient than responding to DMs and trying to get through those. I still do some, but you know, not 200 a day. I can't do that. And uh, so what I started doing is doing converting all that stream time over to Twitch, uh, which is actually a more uh, gun approachable platform uh, than YouTube is, or at least they have shown to be over the past few years. So I do armory streams once a week. Um, I talk about all sorts of other things. I show all sorts of stuff in here that I can't do on YouTube. So again, I can't show items that are, you know, present and uh, that we've been receiving, you know, to talk about uh, here on YouTube. I do that on Twitch. The other thing that I've started doing on Twitch for those of you that are interested in equipment is uh, basically the way Twitch works, for those of you who don't know, is uh, when you subscribe to your favorite content creator, your favorite influencer, your favorite gun person, um, they get money. You pay $5, they get half of it, and uh, then they get the money to support what they're doing. That's how streamers make money, like streaming video games and being a content creator, entertainer, whatever. Uh, what I've started to do over the past few weeks is actually taking all that money, applying it to a gear fund, and then giving away gear equal to that amount of money. So last month I gave away, I think it was about $4,000 worth of stuff. Uh, optics, weapon lights, medical gear, all on Twitch to people that follow and watch uh, my stream. So if you're interested in getting some medical gear, cat tourniquets and things like that, it's not pay to win. You just, you know, if you participate and you're there, uh, you may actually be able to walk away with uh, an Aimpoint Pro uh, or a Surefire light. Um, and we'll be uh, continuing that this week. And then also we have the armory streams in there as well. So there are, there's a community, uh, there's a demographic of people in the chat right now. They might seem a little different, a little unique. They are from Twitch. So uh, very unique actually. <laughs> uh, so they're in here. So let's get, let's talk about what's been going on here at T-Rex Arms. So uh, last week we did something that was pretty big. The first of what is going to be, I hope to be many. Uh, I released my first full rifle class video. Uh, it's a three hour video of a basic carbine class that I ran a bunch of our employees through. Uh, that video has now been watched for over one year of total time uh, of people. Uh, we've had a lot of people hitting our website to watch that video. It is only on our website. It is not getting published to YouTube. Uh, there might be an abridged like 10 minute sort of trailer-esque preview on YouTube at some point, but I honestly don't know when I'll have time to work on that or I don't even know if we will. But if you're interested in some Extra content, this is not to substitute, and I said this at the end of my video, but people never watch the full message. This video is not to substitute not going and taking classes. Uh, I've seen a few instructors insinuating that I you know, presented, put out this video to put them out of business. Well, if you suck, you suck, but you know, people do end up going to one-on-one -on -one classes if you're good. Uh, they're interested in taking classes from you if you're good. So just be good and uh, you'll be fine. Um, but this class is meant to be a substitute, like additional content uh, for you in between classes you're taking with real life individuals on a range. I recommend that people take at least one class a year. Uh, that will give you enough homework to work on on your own time. Taking much more than that if you're not training on your own, in my opinion, in my opinion, I've said this for years, is a waste of money. Uh, if you are not purposely training on your own, you are going to get this much out of a pistol class or a rifle class. In order for that information to take an inception, you know, like multiple layers down into your brain, you have to be purposefully training on your own. You have to be taking the concepts you learn from your favorite instructor dude, you know, mill guy, cop guy, civilian, competition shooter, whatever, and you have to take those concepts and actually work on them yourself with dry fire. I recently had a uh, pro shooter come out here to work with me. I wasn't training him, he was training me, and uh, Joel Park from Practical Training Group, and he gave me a ton of stuff to work on. Now here's the fun part. If I don't work on that stuff on my own time, that time I spent with him was practically useless. Uh, th this much benefit. I have to now put in the time myself, put in the dedication and the motivation to come into this room, set up these little targets uh, from their pro shop, the Ben Steger pro shop, and actually dry fire movement, dry fire, uh, seeing better, faster, sooner, more accurate, all the things he talked about, I have to put in the time outside of the class. And I don't see that message 
promoted enough on the internet or promoted enough by instructors. You know what they say? Oh, come take my level two class, take my level three. I'll make more money. Uh, just train with me, take classes, you'll get better. It, it doesn't happen. You have to put in time on your own. And that's the purpose of the videos we're putting out for free, like the rifle class, a three hour video. So if you're at home, you just finished a class with so-and-so, you know, you train for four or five months and you're like, huh, I kind of want to see if there's something I could be working on in between before I take my next class. I'm going to watch this three hour video that's free at T-Rex Arms on uh, rifle shooting, you know, calling your shots, uh, marksmanship, recoil control, uh, another shooter's perspective. And then inside of that, you'll probably find a couple things you want to start applying at the range. And you know what? You don't have to agree with everything that I'm teaching. You don't have to like me. You know, I'm an unlikable person. I, I know that. I'm not going to pretend like, you know, I'm here to please everyone. I'm not. Uh, but I'm sure there's something in there, at least one or two things that you can take and go, you know what? I need to work on that and train on that on my own. And that's the purpose of the video, not to replace in-person training. If, if you hear any instructors say that's what I'm trying to do, uh, call them out because I've never said that. I never will. Um, you should still do that, but uh, you need to do it purposefully. And I think a lot of shooting like rifle and pistol, can be taught on your own. Uh, you do not have to go through institutions to be a good shooter. You do not have to take 50,000 pistol classes to be a good shooter. You don't even have to shoot 50,000 bullets to be a good shooter. You have to have motivation and discipline yourself to be a good shooter and actually train. So, um, questions. I do want to handle questions on this live, though, because uh, there's all sorts of things going on. Um, but I do want to I do want to check this out. Oh, my back. Uh, let me see. Uh, I hate it when people say you need an instructor present to train. People are capable of holding themselves accountable and videoing yourself helps evaluation. Exactly. I'm primarily a self-taught shooter. I have had uh, specific instances where I'll go out and find an instructor. I'll go to someone like, I'll give you all the list of people that I've trained with, uh, at least the official instructors. Jason Fall from Redback One, like six years ago, his five-day carbine. Uh, John Lovell, I trained with him back before Warrior Poet Society, so that was uh, Night Vision 2, it was the advanced one. I actually asked if I could skip the first one and take that one, he said yes. Uh, CQB class, that one was a little weird though. Um, he, it was sort of an invite thing with me and a couple other people. It was good though, it was good. I'm not going to say it was bad, it wasn't like a normal CQB class though that he runs. Um, I have trained with Joel Park, I've trained with JJ Rakaza. I did a one-on-one -on -one, uh, afternoon with him about four years ago. And I've done some unofficial stuff with other people as well. But of the, of the renowned instructors out there, and it's like five years, four years, three years, two years, one year. There's like a one-year gap between all of it uh, to give me homework so I have time to actually work on it myself where that information can actually take and where it actually makes sense and I can actually action it. It's a really big deal, really big deal. Um, all right, let's see. Um, I, I don't teach classes uh, full-time. I never will. That's uh, the other reason for the videos is I don't teach classes full time. I get a lot of requests from regular folks who want to come take a pistol carbine, whatever. They've seen my videos on YouTube. I'm not a full time instructor, uh, but I want to get some of the emphasis and content out there that I have found to be very useful in training myself on how to shoot. And that's what the rifle video is for. And we're going to have more. The future of the, the training page on our website is going to be we have our uh, uh, the rifle one, uh, the next one I believe is going to be pistol. So basic pistol, I'll do the same thing. Grab nine or 10 people here at work. We're gonna go out, we're gonna shoot basic pistol drills and talk about grip, side alignment, you know, driving the gun, all that good stuff, marksmanship. Uh, definitely get into movement because that's important. Um, and then the next one after that, I think it's gonna be rifle. I hate saying rifle two, like part two, but it'll be rifle part two, not rifle advanced two, but rifle part two. And that will have more stuff on target transitioning, uh, throttle control, and movement. Uh, that'll go straight into simple static to static movement, uh, positioning your hips, uh, looking up on the target, uh, you know, training where you actually are looking in relation to the target and what you're doing. Uh, and then after that, it'll probably be like pistol two, similar stuff, shooting and moving with a handgun uh, and, and movement, and then uh, night vision. I actually want to do night vision. I'm sure people on the internet are going to hate that because I'm not a former mill LE guy who's run night vision operationally, but kind of like with shooting, uh, if you can put night vision on and activate a laser, uh, anyone can shoot with night vision and figure out how it works. Uh, the tactical side, that's when you go to someone like John Lovell. Uh, that's why I went to him. I went to John Lovell for the, the tactical application of night vision. And that entire class, it wasn't shooting. It was uh, reading lighting conditions inside uh, shoot houses, inside their facility. They're at uh, where he worked at, Telluric. Um, the class was actually all like light considerations. 
uh, backlighting yourself, stuff like that, not, or preventing backlighting yourself. Uh, it wasn't actually live fire. We only live fired for like an hour and a half. Uh, so that's when you go to like tactical dude for tactics and then shooting is like shooting. Uh, it's a very awesome way of figuring out what's going on, but very few people get that or they don't like that because it means you have to go to two different people and you have to actually choose certain people that are better at certain things over others. And I'm sorry, one dude isn't the best at everything. That doesn't exist. It doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. So, uh, questions, questions. Uh, the Mantis X system, I would like to use it some. It's a, uh, the Mantis X, for those of you that don't know, is a dry fire system that attaches to the bottom of your pistol and it basically detects, it's got like uh, accelerometers and sensors and stuff in it, all science-y cool stuff. It uh, senses uh, how you're actually pulling the trigger on the gun and what you're doing with the gun. Uh, I think you can then aim at a little target and based on where you shoot on it, it's like an IR laser or vis laser. Um, it's probably our light that is actually sensing though. Uh, it can tell you like, oh, you're dragging the gun low left, you know? So it's a dry fire aid that actually gives you like some feedback on more than say just dry firing without one. Although dry firing without one works fine. Uh, I don't use a Mantis, but I've heard good things from them. Uh, there are units that have actually issued them out. So they will buy them for like their whole like platoon or whatever. And they'll send a few out to people, which is super cool uh, that a training aid like that would actually uh, be in the military. Uh, is very cool. Now, how often dudes actually pick it up and use it? I don't know. <laughs> Probably not a whole lot. Um, and Mr. Park is in the house. All right, what's up? Um, our MP5 is still good, D depending, <laughs> depending, yeah. Best shot timer. I like the pack timer a lot. The club tim timer is great. There's a new one being made, I think, in Italy that looks really cool but expensive. Uh, just get one, get either the little blue boxy one or the pack timer. Uh, at that point, go to work. Like, it doesn't matter which one you get. I like the pack timer. I know people that don't. Um, some people like the little blue one. Uh, the whatever it's called. I can't remember what it's called. Get one of them and just use it. Uh, it actually doesn't matter what timer you get if you don't end up using it. It'll just sit there in a box and do nothing. So just get one and go to work. It'll be great. It'll be awesome. Um, how to get more out of your range day with limited ammo. So here's the best way to get out of your, your range day with limited ammo. So the biggest thing to train with live fire is not weapon manipulation. Now, I know that sounds funny coming from a guy who does a lot of 1R1s on the range and a lot of weapon manipulation on the range. I do. Part of that's because I don't dry fire a lot. I just go to the range and do it all live. Right, do it live, right? Uh, but the reality is if you are on a budget or you have limited ammo, this is what I would recommend. Do your weapons manipulation dry at home. Do your side alignment, your reloads, make sure you're gripping tight though so you don't get into bad habits. Uh, your draws, do all that dry. You don't need to live fire for that. What you need to live fire when you actually go to the range, what you need to be testing and what you need to be practicing is your recoil management and your marksmanship. That's actually it. You can practice all your movement pretty much with dry fire. And Joel showed me some stuff in here in the, in the armory, like uh, we can go to here to here and do this, and this is what you need to pay attention to, and you're seeing through walls, and you're you know, wall hacking on targets, and I'm like, oh, that's super sick, like he's teaching me to, to hack, you know? Um, you could do that all at home. You don't, have to, uh, you don't have to live fire that stuff. So if you're on a budget, like I can only shoot 100 rounds every two weeks or whatever, I would focus on recoil management drills, so five round drills like from the holster or even if you want to remove that variable where you are just working from what I like, what I call compressed ready. Uh, some people do like steel challenge down here, no. Gun right here on buzzer, punch out five rounds at, you know, you could do five, five yards, 10 yards, 15 yards, 20 yards. Uh, you could watch, you, you'll watch your sight rise and fall, you'll see what your group is like at each distance, so you're getting a level of marksmanship, but you're also getting that work of uh, recoil management. Um, then what I would recommend, since marksmanship is the other thing you can't really uh, train with dry fire, is I would do drills at, if you can, 20 yards. Uh, I shoot a lot of 20-yard pistol stuff um, I, because I just find that that helps me up close if I go and shoot far away. Uh, so 20, 25 yards, I do a lot of pistol work, and uh, I would recommend that if you're going to work on marksmanship. USPSA target, uh, you know, four rounds from the draw at you know, 20, 20, 25 yards. Uh, if you're smashing that all A zones, one Charlie in, you know, three seconds, two and a half seconds, you're doing pretty good. So you have that balance of speed and accuracy uh, happening at the same time. And then you just walk it forward and that's all you do. And that would be super beneficial to, to people. All right, so hope that helps. If you are on a budget, that definitely helps. Um, scrolling up. 
Uh, what do you do when neighbors call SWAT on you while you're running around your house? Well, have a plan B. Um, uh, I'm, I'm scrolling through comments, seeing if there's uh, what's going on. SIG556, as far as the rifle goes, uh, I actually just got a budget uh, Smith & Wesson rifle to do stuff, so that'll be fun. Armory stream today, probably not. Oh, it's possible, probably not. I've got some stuff i got to work on, though. Aimpoint Pro or $150 uh, Hollow Sun? So this is a great question. I had a conversation with one of my guys about this the other night while we were playing Tarkov, <sighs> um, and I was actually shopping around for Hollow Suns. Um, I, I would prefer the Pro. I would prefer the aim point uh, over the, with the track record that it has and everything, all things considered. Um, there's nothing wrong with buying a hollow sun. There's nothing wrong with buying a primary arms. I'd rather buy a primary arms though. They're an American based company. To my knowledge, my understanding, hollow sun is more of a Chinese based company uh, creating, I mean, they end up being the same product. Primary arms, little red dots, hundred bucks or the, the hollow sun, hundred dollar red dot. They end up coming from the same sort of location. What, what all's going on? Uh, Primary Arms is an American-based company. They make they do make a bunch of stuff and ship and hire people in America. I would probably go to Primary Arms for that reason. Uh, there's nothing wrong with buying a budget optic. However, I do not think it is wise or provable, and, and the same goes the other way, to say my hollow sun is just as good as the name point. Nobody can prove that. And I don't, I, I would find that very hard to believe. Now, likewise, an Aimpoint uh, fanboy like me could say, well, I know the Aimpoint's better than a Hollow Sun. Well, I haven't factually proved the Aimpoint's better. The Aimpoint has a longer track record. I can say that as a fact. It has been issued and has been in more military theaters than a Hollow Sun. That is a fact. But at the end of the day, don't say dumb stuff like, oh, well, my $100 or my $30 NC Star is just as good as a Neotech. No, it's probably not. But yeah, someone's gonna have to prove it and actually show some data and some numbers and whatnot. So if you get one, just understand that, just understand what you're getting and actually go out and use it. Because at the end of the day, if you don't use the item, it doesn't matter what you buy. Like it actually doesn't matter what you buy if you never intend to use it. If it's a hollow sun, uh, uh, a light that sometimes explodes or uh, you know a janky plate carrier, it actually doesn't matter what you buy if you don't use it. Um, and that's the really fun part about people that talk about how reliable their such and such a gun is. Uh, every gun is reliable. It doesn't get shot. So if you don't go out and shoot, yeah, your gun's amazing and incredible and awesome because it sits there like this lovely uh, upper, R5 upper. And uh, this thing right here is very reliable sitting here doing nothing. I can say it's reliable all day until I actually use it which I think it will be, hopefully. ACOGs are super, again, ACOG right here. Um, I think ACOGs are very viable. They're lightweight, super durable uh, optics. I think they're great. Yeah, don't buy NC Star. I wasn't saying buy one. That's actually like rubbish. Uh, <laughs> uh, tips on p pistol, recoil control, and grip. So the biggest, mis probably one of the biggest problems that I see with shooters, including myself on Instagram or in content in general, is I don't have a pistol to demo with, plus YouTube will not like that. Uh, when I see shooters shooting a pistol, uh, if you watch the muzzle or best or better yet, the weapon light. So watch the weapon light, the X300, the TLR1, whatever. If you see that wobbling after the shot has been fired, so the gun fires, comes back, and the gun then does a little bit of this at the end, uh, that means you're not gripping tight enough with your left hand, uh, like nine times out of 10. If you have some amount of wobble after the recoil of the weapon and it falls dramatically or it is, you know, the gun is moving independently from your left hand, that means you are not gripping tight enough. And I see this with, and I've seen it in my videos. I hate it when I see it. Part of it's uh, I'm having some hand problems. Some days I can't grip very tight with this because I have searing pain through my uh, finger right here. Um, but I try anyway, but I'll see it in videos. I'll see me shooting, it feels really good, and I'll look at that light, I'll look at that X300, and I'll see it doing a little bit of this. And I saw a video from a, from a, a guy, and uh, it was a video on recoil control. And I, I watched the video, and I was like, that gun's wobbling all over the place. That is not good recoil control. Um, you know, the gun is eventually coming back to settle where you can shoot again, but, and it was a slow-mo video too, so you can see it all even better. And I was like, but that gun's all over the place. It's, it's flopping around like a dead fish. Uh, that is not good recoil control. We want to grip a little bit tighter with our left hand, uh, to help control that recoil. So that's one of the biggest problems that I see on the internet and in my videos is I don't grip tight enough. 
Uh, and that was something Joel and I worked on, and uh, it sucks. I still need to figure out what's going on here, but I'll be at the range. Usually it's, uh, it'll get better. One day I'll go out, I can shoot fine. The next day we'll come out to film and I can't grip as tight uh, unless I'm willing to endure some pain. So, um, which, you know, anything for the shot, so it's all right. Uh, I'll do it. So anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens with this hand though. Maybe I'll get a cybernetic hand, that'd be pretty cool. Um, so we'll see. Um, scrolling up, looking for some comments. Uh, any videos coming out with the Wolf Piston Uppers? I would like to in the future, build them out budget. It's just a matter of time getting my uh, guys. Uh, have you seen a doc? I saw someone about it recently. They worked on it, nothing re resulted. Uh, granted, that was one session, so I probably need more than that. So I don't know, we'll see. Stance matters. Uh, stance can make a big difference. Uh, I don't think people should rely on their stance to shoot well um, because that's fairly unrealistic and not a good expectation. But yes, stance helps a lot uh, for sure if you have it. It's not carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel's in your wrist, not your individual fingers typically. It's my understanding at least. It's also only in one finger, which is really odd. Um, I will not abide to YouTube's. Uh, good. Don't, Trevor. Definitely not. Uh, how have I been shooting for? I have been shooting for, okay, and this is important. And, 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 and this is important, self-awareness wise, you guys need to ask yourself this too, because I see it's all the time and, and, and it's a problem. When you get asked how long you've been shooting for, I could say I've been shooting since I was uh, 13, is when I shot my first kel little pink water gun pistol thing. And then I shot a deer the next day. That was the first time I shot a firearm, 13. So I could say, I've been shooting since I'm 13. That though is not a very true statement because I didn't really start to shoot like seriously, like with conditions and with some understanding until I was like uh, 20. And that's when I started going to competitions. I was like, yeah, I wasn't quite 21. I couldn't legally carry a pistol. <laughs> that was the best part. Uh, Cause that's when I started T-Rex. I started shooting somewhat seriously when I was 20. And then I got really serious about three years after that. So I've been shooting seriously, like a lot seriously, like with self-training, purposeful training, shot timers, conditions for only about five years, five or six years. Um, so I think that's important for people to realize, like just because you've been handling guns for a long time doesn't mean you're good. Um, it's when your brain flips the switch of, wow, there's a whole world of stuff I don't know that I can learn and get better at. Uh, it's the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, I think is what it's called. Uh, you need to get over that hump of you know everything, and as soon as you come down to the bottom, that's where it starts of, wow, I actually don't know everything. I actually have a lot to learn. And that's where you actually start shooting, in my opinion. Uh, so I think that's important for people to understand when they're thinking about like, oh, I've been shooting for 50 years. And it's like, well, but have you actually been shoot shooting for 50 years or playing with guns for 50 years? Because there is a little bit of a difference. How do you approach class development as an instructor? It's really simple. There's two uh, methods, and I'm, I'm probably gonna do a video on this uh, separate uh, of instructing. There is a curriculum based and there is, a, I think they call it outcome based training or basically building the class around the student needs. So to generate the best outcome. So I do not do a curriculum. Um, I think curriculum based training is great if you need to punch out a lot of people and have consistent SOPs and consistent uh, guidelines that you're giving people. The problem with curriculum based training, it is usually not high standards enough. It is often uh, generally generated to the lowest common denominator. So if you have a class of let's say 10 students and you have a curriculum, you go at the beginning, we do this, and then we do this, and then we do this, and we shoot these drills, these targets, we score them this way, we move on, all right? And, and, and you have this thing that you do. Uh, the problem is you'll have uh, like three or four students in that class or probably every class who have exceeded the curriculum and they need more to excel. And then you'll have one or two just idiots who they're, they're just there to do the reps and just they're not actually getting anything out of it because there's always like that one person in the class who's really not getting a whole lot. They're just there to, to be there, right? Um, to attend. Um, so the problem with curriculum based training is you are not helping uh, like a substantial percentage of your class be able to excel because you are like, nope, we're gonna follow the curriculum. We're gonna follow the set doctrine that we have. And if you don't like it, well, you can leave or you're, you can't because you just have to stay there. So I prefer having a much more uh, dynamic to get all like tactical instructor words uh, approach to training where it's based on student needs. 
So I have a very rough outline of, at the beginning of the day, we do a cold start. From the cold start, I immediately know exactly where everyone's at as far as basic shooting goes, weapons handling and confidence. After that, we move into you know, uh, grip, stance, side alignment, whatever is like the basic thing we really need to hit on. And then we move on from there. And if I see, you know, multiple people doing the same thing during a drill, I'll be like, okay, well, they're all not doing good follow through. They're jumping off of the gun too fast. So the next drill we're going to do real fast to communicate and show them why this is a problem is I'm going to do my permission to fire drill. All right, everyone back here at 25 yards on the buzzer, you, you will fire a shot. You will not fire a shot unless you hear a buzzer. And that keeps everyone from coming out of the gun. They stay on the gun and they're waiting for a instance, so a target appearing, uh, to be able to shoot again versus coming off the gun and then having to get back on it. Um, so you have to, I think it is a far better approach for all the students across the board to tailor the training off of their skill level and their competence than following a curriculum. I don't think a curriculum is bad. Uh, a curriculum can produce some good results and consistent results, and that's why uh, institutions use uh, curriculums. I don't think it's the best for developing individual shooters or individual people in whatever skill you're teaching. Uh, so I prefer a much more dynamic, I hate that word, a much more uh, variable, uh, is that the right word, uh, approach to teaching. It's harder though. Following a curriculum is super easy because you have it all planned out. You can basically swap, switch your brain off. You can literally be like, okay, I know what we're doing next. I just need to get them through steps one, two, three, four, five, and then I'll get my money and then I'll go home. Um, there's a lot of curriculum-based training that is done in that way, and that's not effective. So, um, uh, someone's asking about, it looks like, what's going on with sidecars? Well, it's... Some changes can't be made quietly. Our IWB holsters are temporarily unavailable for purchase while we finish the last major steps in retooling our production line. All right, where was I? Uh, let's see, scrolling back down. Adaptive training, thank you. That's a good way to put it. Dynamic, dynamic training. It's been a while uh, uh, since we've had dynamics uh, used uh, in training. <laughs> All right, um, are you gripping with your top fingers more or more with ring and pinky? Hang on, I gotta think about this, my poor brain, hang on. Top, top fingers. All of them? <laughs> Uh, no, more, no, it's literally all of them. Uh, it's not more. It's not more uh, for, uh, top or bottom. It's literally. I'm just gripping with all of them in the grooves of my hand, gripping tight, trying to roll my my thumb up into the frame as much as I can. Uh, no, not one finger more than another. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> upload the 50 video already. We haven't filmed one yet. Yeah, dynamic influencer. The two most cringy words ever. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Um, will you ever run anything that doesn't have a military contract? Uh, I don't know. Gun wise. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, the RSAS. Yeah. That didn't win the contract. I'll shoot that sucker. Um, what do you look for in a class? All right. So this is what I look for in a class. Cause I, I do obviously reach out to people and go and learn stuff from them. Like Joel, uh, here's what I look for in instructors. I look for, first off, the, the first thing you need to look for is what do I need? So you need to look for, for example, if, if you're somewhere where you're like, I focused a lot on shooting, I need land nav. I need small unit tactics. Well, that right there is going to filter out a lot of people that you could go and train with because they're not going to talk about that stuff in the class. You need to go over here and get this. So you need to establish what do you need. If you are a competitive shooter and you're like, I need to learn better stage planning, more effective stage planning, the mental side, then you're going to want to look for a competition shooter not a military guy. You're gonna wanna to go to a competition shooter. If you're someone who's like, I just, I'm not as good at shooting as I'd like to be, I just need someone who's really squared away on uh, weapon manipulation and just shooting and understanding of shooting, and I wanna go get their perspective on you know, homework assignments that I can work on on my own. Well, then you just need to look for someone that is much better than you and can teach. And so generally speaking, what I look for is I establish what I need, so if that is, High level pistol shooting, 
I'm like, cool, I want this guy. I want this guy who has demonstrated he's a high level pistol shooter. He puts videos. My biggest thing is if someone, if an instructor doesn't demo or doesn't produce videos, not interested. Uh, if they aren't willing to show like what they're actually doing, uh, I'm not interested in training with them. That's my personal SOP. If you guys don't care about that as much, that's fine. I go to people who are willing to like put their stuff out there. Uh, so for Joel, super easy. He shoots competition and he puts videos on Instagram. I can watch them and immediately see he's got stuff that I want. I want to train with him. Um, but you really need to look for people that are willing to put stuff out there, in my opinion. There's a lot of folks out there that hide behind their resume. There's a lot of people out there that hide behind their certificates. There's a lot of people out there that hide behind their affiliations with companies. Uh, their competence literally relies on the success of the entities that sponsor them. That is pretty cringe, if you ask me. If your entire like persona and or your like level of skill is based on the companies and their success, like no, you should have success apart from all these people that you work with. Like you should have your own stuff when you can, versus relying on oh, I rely on this company that I work with. That's how I have credibility. Like, no, you should actually be able to stand on your own two feet with competence. Um, there's a lot of instructors out there uh, that fall into all those categories. And if, if what you need is high level, whatever it is you're looking for, it probably won't work with those guys. Like I, I'm, I'm just gonna say it. Uh, there's instructors out there I will not go and train with for shooting because I know I won't get good shooting. I would go to them for other stuff like tactics or like uh, medical or whatever, I wouldn't go to them for shooting. I'd go to someone else who specializes in shooting. So the first thing you've got to do is establish what do you need? And then you look for the person that is demonstrating they have that thing that you need. It's that simple. I know people hate hearing it, but it is what it is. Okay. Um, any recommendations or training to handle manually operated? Uh, lever action would be nice for foreigners. Uh, to be honest, I I'll tell you, I'll tell you the trick. If you are shooting a weird gun, such as a lever action, go watch videos of professional cowboy action shooters and copy what they do and you'll be good to go. Uh, you don't need a special class on how to run a lever action. Go watch any cowboy action shooter. They have it down to a T, uh, how fast they do this action and run that gun. Um, you don't you don't need that from a, a, a professional like shooter class lever action Kalashnikov class you don't need that um, you you just need to go watch like a couple of videos see the technique they're doing and then copy it it's that simple like it really is um, how far can one get with self training uh, pretty far uh, actually. Uh, it all, again, it all comes down to your motivation and your discipline. Uh, if you're willing to troubleshoot, you're willing to try things, you're willing to fail, you're willing to fix those failures. Um, I know dudes that are entirely self-taught who do very well in competitions. I know guys that are entirely self-taught, get this. So I've had two stories. This is super fun. Another reason why I'm doing these training videos. I got a story recently from a guy who said, hey, I was just at a big event um, with a bunch of people. Uh, they were talking about you and these other YouTubers and they were making fun of you and blah, 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 like whatever. He said, but the best shooter at the event was a guy with skinny jeans, a flannel shirt, and a T-Rex hat. Um, I love hearing that kind of thing. Uh, there was another instance of this, because, uh, you know, and, and I'll get to my point, uh, where I was at the Cobalt Kinetics two-gun match earlier this year. Uh, and the guy that came in, I think it was second or third, uh, for practical, I think it was practical division. It was his first multi-gun match, and he ended up being a big fanboy, said he's been watching all of our videos for years, and he won a surefire suppressor. First multi-gun match, pistol rifle, at a fairly competitive match, there were some good shooters there, and he walked away with a $1,000 surefire suppressor. These are guys that aren't going out and taking tons of classes. They watch some videos online, they pay attention to some of the instruction, and they go and train on their own. They get a shot timer, they go into a dry fire, they go to the range, and then they show up and they can, they can play. They can get along just fine. Uh, Self-training can get you very far as it comes to shooting. Now, when it comes to more specialized stuff, and this is where people don't understand uh, the, the premise, when it comes to specialized stuff like tactics and CQB and you know, stuff like that, like, yeah, you're gonna need to go to someone who's more specialized and understands that stuff and has had experience doing some of that to actually explain what's going on. But shooting, just like pulling triggers and aiming through a sight, you don't need anything special for that. Like you can figure that out on your own. It's not rocket surgery. Um, all right. Um, 
How do you practice what you learned in a class in an outdoor range when I only have indoor ranges near me? So and this is gonna depend person to person uh, based on where you live. If you only have an indoor range, you can still practice your uh, trigger management and your recoil control. There's still a lot you can practice in an indoor range, but you're right, at some point, you're gonna be limited in what you can do. Uh, and based on how serious you are, interested you are, you may need to drive an hour and a half to an outdoor range. Uh, you may need to drive an hour and a half to a USPSA match. Um, I have to drive right now, if I want to go to any USPSA match, I have to drive an hour. So if I all of a sudden am like, I want to drive out there at 7 a.m. on a Saturday, that's what I have to do. And that's fine. Uh, if I'm willing to do it, I'll go and I'll do it. Um, and that's uh, the expectation that you'll have a range 10 minutes from your house in the United States of America right now. Uh, is not a realistic one. Uh, there's just not a lot of ranges out there. There's very few ranges out there that will allow movement. There's very there's a lot of ranges that just hide behind a lot of uh, risk and liability safety waivers uh, just to protect themselves. Um, and yes, that does make it hard to train and it sucks. There's very few good ranges out there. I'm hoping in the future T-Rex or some entity can come forward and create a bunch of ranges that allow people to the freedom of movement and they figure out a way to do it with insurance and the risk and liability and all that good stuff. But yeah, there's not a lot of ranges that allow it. That sucks. It really sucks. The woods, yeah, go to the woods, go to BLM land. For those of you who don't know, BLM is Bureau of Land Management, not the other BLM. People are going to get all weird about me saying that. Um, sounds like a business. Yeah. Um, how many rounds is a typical match? A typical USPSA match will be 120, 100 to 140, depending on if it's all steel, paper, uh, Virginia count. It, it'll depend, but I would say you need to have about 150 rounds on you. Really depends, though. Really depends. Uh, amount of targets for a good training session. All right, so steel or paper? Excellent question. Uh, I don't train on steel. Uh, not anymore. Uh, very rarely. I'll do it at distance for uh, repetition. Uh, I shoot paper of 50 meters and in, um, all paper. I very rarely shoot steel. And the reason I don't shoot on steel is it lies. You get a steel hit, it sounds great, it looks great. You get a little, little uh, dopamine straight to the brain. Uh, it's the best feeling ever to hit a steel target and know I did well, I got my hit. The problem with the steel target is if it's the size of me, I'm skinny though, I'm tiny, but if I turn sideways, you can't even shoot me. Um, the hitbox is tiny. But uh, if you shoot a steel target that is like, this width and you hit here, you'll get a hit, but was that a, was that a precise hit? Well, maybe it depends what conditions you're shooting under, but possibly not. So I shoot paper like all the time and on video, it kind of sucks because you guys don't know where the hits are unless I walk up and show them. And so I have people that say, Oh, shoot more steel. So we know what's going on. And it's like, well, that's actually easier than shooting paper. Um, so we shoot paper, we shoot paper for everything like 50 meters and in, uh, as soon as we start doing like a hundred, 200, 300, 400, that's when it's like, okay, we'll use steel, you know, so that we don't have to walk down there and paste the targets. We still have a marksmanship standard, Alpha Charlie, reduced Alpha Charlie target uh, from TA targets, um, which is a great tiny little target to shoot at 400 meters. Most people have like a, a full IPSC or full USPSA, not a little like little, little dude. Um, I was shooting those yesterday out to three, three four, I was like 380 max down to like two, actually no, it was about 300 to 380 is about what it was. Um, it's good fun. So, oh my, my back. Um, so anyway, paper and steel, train with paper. And uh, we should have a product soon, hopefully, to uh, help you guys with some of that. Uh, I just leaked something, shoot. I usually save that for Twitch. Oh well, uh, well I don't know when it's gonna happen though, we'll see. Uh, join a sportsman's club with an outdoor, okay, I'm gonna talk about something real fast. I think this is really important. We got 14 minutes left. Um, what, uh, I'm going to ask a question for you guys, and, and, and this is important because this, this plays into ranges, right? This plays into range culture and the word sportsmen and, and all that. Why, why does the gun community lose? Like, why do, have we over the past 50 years or longer, if you want to go back, why have we consistently lost the right to own certain weapons, the ability to carry certain weapons, and why is the conversation constantly defensive and reactionary based on whatever the, the, uh, the anti-gun crowd is saying? Why is it that we're always on, I don't want to say the run, but we're, we're kind of on the run. We're on the run to catch up or on the run to, to get away from whatever's coming. 
Like, do you guys really know, and this is a big question, this is a big question, every gun company, in my opinion, and every consumer, you guys, gun owners, and every influencer or person at the top needs to be thinking about. And the reason I bring this up is I firmly believe one of the reasons we are constantly on the run, we're constantly on the defensive, we're constantly having to, uh, you know, back off of the definitions uh, behind, you know, why we own guns. You know, people are like, oh, this gun, it's a, it's a weapon of war. And then we have companies that go, oh, no, it's a sporting rifle. And so that's constantly a step backwards. It's sugarcoating what firearms are for. I honestly believe the, one of the biggest reasons that we have been losing the cultural fight for guns, because you don't get gun regulations through politics, you get them through culture, because uh, politics is downstream from culture, culture comes first, is because of the emphasis on prioritizing safety over understanding. Now, I have some clear examples of this, and I know this is going to sound weird, because gun safety to everyone is a, is a lovely thing, right? Everyone likes it. It sounds great on paper, it, it, and it is great. But the problem with prioritizing safety over competence is you get people, and I've had them before, who are more interested in following the rules, like the firing line, than understanding that, hey, I should have the competence, the ability, and the understanding that I can operate a weapon downrange or uprange of someone else, and nothing bad will happen. And I've had this, years ago we would do videos, uh, Charles or Chad would be downrange of the camera and I would have dozens of comments from people saying, he's downrange from you. And it's like, yes he is. I know how a gun works, I know where the bullet goes, I know it's chambered, I know it's hot, I know what's going to happen when I pull the trigger. That's why I'm not aiming the gun at him, I'm aiming it over here. Yeah, he's downrange of me. And there's no problem with that. No unsafe act is occurring in this video. But... There's this emphasis that has been put on by ranges, and I'm going to say ranges are to blame for some of this. I'll say Hunter's Ed is, I'll get to that in a second, is to blame for people being more scared about guns than being interested in actually understanding what's going on. And it's why we're losing the fight for guns, because you get people in D.C. and you get people in politics who want to prioritize, uh, you know, that guns are for hunting and guns are for sporting use and guns need to be locked up. And it's because of things like, uh, for example, uh, I was researching Hunter's Ed courses. This is real fun. This is part of culture, right? And kids go through Hunter's Ed when they're like, I don't know, eight years old, 12 years old, 10 years old. And what I was finding in the majority of states with Hunter's Ed programs is this one piece of text that said, guns should be stored with the ammunition in a separate place. Now, the reason this is a problem is at a very young age, what this is communicating to kids is guns should be separate from ammunition. Guns are an item that we don't do anything with besides hunting. And I've, I've had these people come through my page. And these are the people that give up rights for guns. And they go, we don't need AR-15s for hunting. We don't need this or that. And so I, I honestly believe one of the biggest reasons that we're constantly on the run and we're constantly on the defensive is because we have neutered and sugarcoated what guns are about and what we're actually willing to understand about firearms in general. And I've been talking about this for years. It's not like this is something that just has come up this week or whatever. Uh, I've been talking about this for years. Uh, I have another story. This is a great one. This contributes to it. People's fear of guns or understanding or lack thereof of guns. I was at a USPSA competition uh, uh, probably five years ago, uh, four years ago. It was a little while ago. And an individual, they have very strict rules for gun handling. And I understand why. I'm not going to say they're necessarily bad. Um, but this scenario, I think, it, it contributes to people being scared of guns and not willing to speak up or try to, uh, try to have a greater understanding for firearms. They just want to fall into the, the cultural norm. Uh, someone's pistol fell out of the holster. Uh, empty gun. Uh, not a shooter. Uh, just walking around the range, pacing targets. Empty gun falls on the deck. I've told the story before. And uh, so the, the range RO, it was my squad, said, oh, everyone stop, stop. Gun on the ground. Oh, shoot. So everyone backs up and clears away. And uh, they said, we got to get the match director here. We got a gun on the ground. And it was like uh, Monsters, Inc. when the sock like lands on the floor and they're like, oh, quick, everyone. It's, it's the exact same thing. So the match director finally shows up and he's like, whose gun? Who's gonna? Oh, is that yours? It's, oh, is it empty? Oh, it's empty. Okay. And he walks over and I kid you not. I kid you not. This is, I, I was a little livid because I had been thinking about like, hey, why is the gun community so like flimsy when it comes to what the, the purpose of firearms are for? Like, wh wh why do we own these? Why don't people actually say why these exist? They don't. They want to dance around the issue, right? He goes over and literally picks it up with two fingers. And then he turns it to the guy and goes, here's your unloaded handgun. And the guy's like, oh, okay. Put the holster. 
what that demonstrated to everyone at that, new shooters alike, is guns bad, guns dangerous, guns cannot be trusted, guns have to be trusted by certified individuals, match directors, range officers, not me, the individual. Only the, 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 the clerical, the, the clerics can actually handle the weapons and make the rules. We just have to abide by them. That's a big problem. Like that is literally like neutering everyone, having that kind of cultural understanding or cultural pushes education or miseducation in my opinion. Like, no, that's an unloaded gun on the deck. Nothing should stop anyone from being able to walk over there, aim in a safe direction and return it to their holster. But no, we have people out there who want to turn this into a bigger deal than it is and promote just safety guidelines and rules over understanding and respect for the firearm. And so I honestly think that has contributed to why we are losing gun rights and general gun understanding because the, the culture surrounding firearms is just so weak. It's just so like misunderstood. People want to mince their words what guns are for. They don't want to say it. I have a video coming up on a rifle, uh, hopefully soon. And we're going to talk about, I won't give the whole thing away, but the worst thing about the gun uh, isn't anything on the gun, actually. Uh, it actually has to do with the way the gun is marketed and sold uh, because of the idea that it perpetuates. Uh, and I think these are things that people really need to talk about because uh, um, more than just like, you know, how do we get suppressors? Uh, the conversation that really needs to be happening right now is how do we get people that are more competent with guns who don't fear guns as much because those are going to be the people that actually fight for our rights in the future. I, I'm not counting on, you know, boomer fuds who just want to hunt standing up with us and trying to prevent these from getting regulated or night vision from getting regulated in a few years. I, I'm not counting on them. I, I really, uh, I have no reason to count on them. Um, but I am concerned that due to how weak the community is on some issues, on some instances where firearms, the emphasis of firearms and why we have them, uh, that they won't stand up for these things when they come up. And that's a big deal because it all starts, it starts literally at the bottom. It starts with your hunter's ed programs. It starts with your CCW classes. It starts with your instructors. It starts with your, you know, your uncle, your grandpa telling you, you know, here's how you treat a gun. You never keep it with the ammo. And it's like, well, that's not very effective for home defense. Like, these ideas make a big difference in the grand scheme of things. And it's why we have politicians in office right now who were told, you know, this much stuff about guns when they were growing up and they're there in power now. And that's what they think about guns. They weren't told from a young age, hey, guns were designed, guns are innovated and guns are uh, created to uh, maim, incapacitate and kill uh, for good or worse. Uh, that is what firearms are designed and innovated uh, for and optimized for is uh, killing. That, that is what they're for. Uh, if if uh, politicians knew that and were educated on that at a much younger age and then shot guns, shot modern weapons and just understood some of that, we would have a lot less issues uh, in politics as far as uh, educating people on gun rights and actually like figuring out what's going on. But no, people want to dance around the issue and sugarcoat it and make it sound more nice and lovely than it is. And no, they, they, people need to stop. So... Bit of a bit of a rant, bit of a rant here, but I, I do think it's a big issue that people aren't talking about enough. They're not thinking. They're not thinking long term enough. It's more like, what's the thing I can be upset about today? What's the the gun legislation that's coming out today? Uh, what's the ATF director thing happening today? Like, no, we we've got to think five years, ten years down the road. Like, what are we doing right now to prevent night vision from being regulated in five years? Because that's where we're headed. Is night vision probably two to five years? Body armor, uh, well, whenever a shooting happens where there's body armor, uh, in the future, I mean, those are all on the chopping block coming up. Um, and, and people need to be thinking about that, not just the current thing happening right now, right this instance. That's how you lose. Uh, that's not how you gain the initiative. Oh, boy. Um, so, uh, let me get back up here some questions. I, that was a little bit of a rant, but it's a big deal. More on that later. I'm going to talk about that more. Um, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of people that they, they just want to follow rules more than, uh, having some uncommon sense. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, uncommon sense. That's what I call it. Um, wait, so, wait, are people asking about holsters? Uh, I've tried to see 1911 sidecars. 
Uh, some changes can't be made quietly. Our IWB holsters are temporarily unavailable for purchase while we finish the last major steps in retooling our production line. All right. Uh, let's see, what, what else are we on? Teach people to drive nods. Exactly, that should be normal. That should be commonplace, driving with night vision. <laughs> I still need to get an M203. Yeah, why, why are we not allowed to have M203s? That's a great question. Why are some of these items uh, un un understood as civilians can't own? Like that, we, the best thing to do when you're, when you're thinking about gun laws and registrations is take, take any restriction we have right now that we have and literally backtrack and go, why is it that people think we should not own, possess, or have this? And backtrack it. How many years? What was gun culture like back then? Who was in power? where the NRA was at, let's say, uh, and that'll tell you everything you need to know. Why we can't own grenade launchers, certain kinds of guns, uh, short-barreled rifles, just backtrack, backtrack everything. Why is 37 millimeter okay, but 40 millimeter not? It's a great question from T-Rex Arms. I wonder who asked that. Great question. Yeah, well, wh what's up with that? It's most likely a loophole uh, where 40 millimeter was outlawed, but 37 came in later is probably what it was and then it's like well why is 40 outlawed right so you need to backtrack and you're good to go uh imagine paying 200 dollars to put a plastic a piece of plastic on your rifle very this is very true so but the problem is people aren't willing to do something about it they they just want to they just want to be upset about it no you 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 all can what i've told people from generally on instagram lives which i'm not allowed to do anymore uh if you want to make a difference and you don't have a platform of 2 million people, or you don't have a platform of 10,000, you're not an influencer, you're not, a, you're not a gun guy who's out there getting sponsorships, uh, you can make a difference, and I'm going to argue you can make more of a difference than some of these influencers. I think some influencers out there are actually doing more harm than good, especially the ones that sugarcoat what guns are about, they shill certain products, they're shilling lame products to people. I actually think they're doing more damage than you doing this simple thing. Study, get out there and train, and then talk to five people. That's all you have to do. Talk to five people. And from that, you'll have two or three of them that go, wow, I get it now. And then they'll go and educate five people. That's literally all it takes. It takes every single person just doing a little bit of work and putting a little bit of skin in the game. Like, you wouldn't believe how many people out there, and I, and I notice this every time it comes up, whenever people ask us, hey, can you come to our state and save our state? No, we can't. You've got to do that yourself. Like, don't stop relying on other people to do your job. Like that's how we get into a lot of messy situations here in our own country to begin with. You need to clean up your own mess and your own stuff, like in your own state. Like we're doing stuff here in Tennessee. It'd be cool if we could do stuff everywhere, but the problem is a lot of people would just, just like they did with the NRA, they were like, ah, the NRA's got our back. We're not gonna do anything. We'll surrender all of our responsibility. We'll give them a little bit of money. I'll get a little bag made in China. They'll do all the work. Yeah, look, what did that do for us? <laughs> Nothing. We get a little bag made in China and that's it. No, every single person, all you have to do is educate five people around you, go to the range, take your, your, your modern uh, uh, sporting rifle uh, with your ACOG and your IR laser and your weapon light and your suppressor, and guess what? That's the new normal thing. That's common use, and now that stuff is much harder to regulate. That's literally how it works. So, just five things. Um, advice on how to expose more Hispanic Americans to gun culture. Uh, it's the same way we do it for everyone else. I, I, I don't know what to say there. The same way you do it for anyone. Anyway, uh, leak the nylon. No, I will not. Uh, there are some things we're playing with, though, that I'm sure you'll see in some photos. So you'll see. Uh, there's no fleeing to safety. You're not wrong. You have to make your own safety. This is my safety, sir. Uh, 762 by 39 shingles. At some point, yeah, it'll be it'll probably be the DMR shingle, which will hold uh, scar mags and M110 mags. We'll probably do a 762 by 39. Yep. <clears throat> um, carry your gun on you. You know how many people don't even carry a gun who think they're pro gun? A lot. It's like, why don't you carry a handgun? Oh, it's dangerous. That it's supposed to be dangerous. That's what. That's why we have guns. Is they're dangerous. That's literally why. Um. Uh, I'm still going through your thoughts on the RGP. Ah, finally, someone of, someone of, of culture. Uh, we're going to be playing with it. I, I have the, the RSAS right back there, the R11. I've uh, been shooting a little bit. It's very cool. We actually just got another one, uh, plus a bunch of R5 uppers. Um, more on those, although they're discontinued. They're, they're cool because it's a, it's a project that didn't go anywhere. Remington is now gone. They're very hard to get. So I, 
I like historical items from the modern era. I really could care less about forever ago. Um, but modern weapons, modern innovation done by companies that are not defunct uh, interests me, um, such as stuff uh, like this. And uh, that's why we picked a bunch up. We'll be talking more about them in videos. But you can't really get them. They don't exist, and warranties doesn't work. So um, th there is that. So 80% uh, builds, pretty cool. A very cool concept for 80% builds. Um, you know, no paperwork is very intriguing to me. Um, it's not even secret ingredient because um, it's just an 80%. So uh, I think they're very intriguing. I think they're really cool. So... Um, anyway, uh, more questions, more questions. Let's see. Uh, what's up with Canada Optic on the left side of the carbine? No, it's not. It's, I did that for a, a demonstration. It's not effective, no, unless you're a lefty. So um, there is a difference in pro-gun and pro-second amendment. I've been saying it for years. There is a clear difference in people being pro-gun, just liking guns for whatever personal thing that they like having the gun for, and actually being pro-personal responsibility, not relying on the government, um, you know, being willing to actually uh, uphold the constitution of your country. Um, you don't have to swear an oath to do that. Like you can do your duty as a citizen and uphold the constitution, uphold uh, good principles and principles of freedom. Like you don't have to swear an oath or sign a, a dotted line for that. Like every citizen, in my opinion, uh, has a duty to uh, their fellow countrymen. And that can be educating five people around you on firearms so that we can keep those in our country uh, so that they can be used to hopefully preserve freedom or hopefully not even be used in the first place to preserve freedom, but they're there in case, you know, it has to be done. Um, there's every single person can do a little bit. Obviously, you can call your senators, you can send letters to your congressmen uh, when stuff like the David Chipman stuff happens. I know. Sometimes that makes a difference. I, I don't think it always does. I think that can be a false sense of security too, where people send in their one letter and they're like, oh, I did all my work for this year for my country. And it's like, no, there's more you can actually do. Um, but yes, there's a lot of things you can be doing. Even with the right organizations, I, I, I will emphasize the right organizations, uh, donating and supporting the right organizations who are actually doing good work, uh, who have the capital uh, and the manpower and the expertise to actually like battle lawsuits and regulations and laws and stuff like that. Uh, probably one of the most encouraging things to me over the past few years is seeing how many people have woken up to uh, how troublesome the NRA has, done, has been for both culture and laws in general. Uh, that's probably been one of the biggest successes of the gun community is recognizing that and people being willing to take personal responsibility in their own state at the state level and be able to talk to people and not just donate some money to an organization, you know, shut their eyes and be like, all right, we'll get the Hearing Protection Act. Um, didn't happen, um, but are actually putting in some work themselves. And I think that's one of the coolest things that's, uh, that's been happening the past few years, past few years uh, uh, in particular. So anyway, with all that said, guys, thanks so much. We're uh, right here at about an hour. No, uh, answer the question. Which one? <laughs> well, let, let me see if there's let me see if there's a legitimate one here. Let me see. Claymore holsters. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got. Some changes can't be made quietly. Our IWB holsters are temporarily unavailable for purchase while we finish the last major steps in retooling our production line. With all that said, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, again, I think we have a couple of interesting streams coming up over the next couple of weeks. Uh, one on customer service stuff and how we handle things here at T-Rex Arms. That might be next week or the week after, I can't remember. Um, so definitely don't miss that one because that will actually be in the customer service department and we'll have some of the other guys coming over and uh, talking through various things that we you know, help people with through our customer service. So a little different, a little different format. And uh, that'll be good, that'll be good stuff. So again, Thanks so much, guys. Uh, that rifle training video is live on our website on the training page. It's three hours long, free. It does not cost you a dime. Uh, you can skip through it. There is a table of contents with exact like recoil control, shot calling, you know, marksmanship, you know, whatever the thing is. And uh, you can go in there and be like, I want to see what I need to learn how to reload faster. I'm just going to click on how to reload. Or I want to learn this thing over here. Oh, type on malfunction. Or well, it's, I don't need you to call them that. But, you know, failure to feed or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then you can just watch it based on that table of contents or you can just watch the whole thing.
like a Lord of the Rings marathon. That might be a little hard, but I know some people have done it and they've emailed us and they liked it. So that's cool. Uh, so thanks so much guys for tuning in and I will see you all next time.